So guys, uh, out in revolution land, um, hello, how are you? Uh, I'm going to start with my traditional international greeting, which is every time I, I use it, I, I sort of add another language to it. And Max, if you've got any, please feel free to jump in. So hello, bonjour, ciao ragazzi, ni hao, uh, shalom, salam alaikum, habibi, aloha, and uh, wagwan. So how are you, Max? I am great. It's always great to be with you, Wayne. How are uh, you? This is very kind of you. And, and, you know, we're celebrating a momentous occasion this year, the 10th anniversary of the LM. Of course, I'm wearing my personal LM on my wrist, which I have to say I adore. Um, and, and Max, I wanted to start with a, an analogy, if you will let me. <clears throat> So interestingly, one of my favorite movies is also based on another one of my favorite movies, just in a different language. So one of my favorite films is The Magnificent Seven, the original version. Uh, and that was, of course, based on The Seven Samurai by uh, Akira Kurosawa. But what I love about The Magnificent Seven is I think it's a master class on talent spotting, you know, and activating people's true potential, right? So Yul Brynner, who, Chris Adams, I believe is his character, goes around spotting the best gunfighters and helps them to activate their potential to defend this Mexican village. The only person in reality that I can think of that has that level of talent spotting and the capacity to act, actualize uh, talent is you, Max. And, and, I, and, and you know, some of the best work I've ever seen from you know, some wonderful watchmakers has been done uh, in collaboration with you. But I wanted to talk about three individuals in particular who I find truly fascinating. Um, and the first one is Jean-François Mojan. The second one is Kari Vutalainen. And the third one is a former Oxford theology student named Stephen McDonald. So let's talk a little bit about them and about their journey related to the LM 10th anniversary. Please, let's start with perhaps Jean-François Mojan, sir. So, um, Jean-François, I, uh, I actually heard of initially from my good friend Denis Giguet when he created MCT. So that's that dates back, I think, 12 years ago, something like that, 13 years ago. And, um, and he had this idea, and Jean-François Mojan, in this record time, managed to create this, the, the sequential piece. And uh, he'd also, at the same time, he had been working on the Degris Ogono mechanical digital watch. I can't remember what it was called, which was really impressive. And so, you know, we're in a very um, classic conservative uh, industry, and it's rare to find engineers, watchmakers, who actually get out of the boundaries. And when you spot one, you're like, whoa, 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 who's this guy? Well, who is this? And, uh, and Denis was very impressed with him. So um, we, we got together and started getting to know each other because you can't start a project with somebody you actually don't know. At least I don't think so. I, I wouldn't cold call somebody and say, I don't know who you are, I've never met, but would you like please to develop this four-year project with me? And so you really need to know if you've got the same uh, values, a uh, sense of humor, you enjoy hanging out with each other. And, uh, and so I got to know him. And when the LM1 project came in mind, um, so it must have been much more than 12 years ago. <laughs> this was probably 14 years ago or something like that. Um, you know, that's uh, getting old. <laughs> you start losing your references. And, um, and so um, uh, I immediately thought of him. And, uh, and it was amazing because it was at the beginning of his journey. He hadn't yet, I don't think he had come out yet with his opus. Uh, no, because his opus came out in 2010, if I'm not wrong. And so he was working on it. And, uh, and so, yeah, we, we would go up to, to, uh, to Le Locle and, uh, and work with him on that project. And he immediately said yes. And actually, he had already worked with Kari. What most people don't know is that the échappement um, à détente, how do the detent escapement, yes. um, movement from Urban Jürgensen, which most people don't even know of, had been created by Jean-François Mojon working with Kari. Kari's name was not on it. And Kari in those days would never let anybody have his name on it. And uh, of course I knew Kari. And so that sort of led to it would be great if we had Kari on that project. Why? Because LM1 was all about tribute, tribute to the great master watchmakers of the 18th and 19th century. And so from there, um, you needed somebody who actually had restored so many beautiful pieces. Kari immediately came to mind. And, um, and so from there, we went up to uh, Motier and, um, and, uh, <laughs> It was, I think, uh, I've told you this story, which was really amazing. So I arrived there with Jean-François, with Serge Kriknov, our, our CTO and my partner in the company. And we tell Kari, 
would you agree to work on a project with us? It's not going to be a crazy HM. It's a new project. Uh, it's going to be much more classic. It's about giving tribute to the great master watchmakers of the 19th, in this case, really 19th century. And he looks at us and he says, oh, thank you so much. I'm very honored, but no. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean no? <laughs> he says, no, I, I, uh, I just have too much work. And this is already 13 years ago. I've got too much work, can't do it, would love to, but thank you very much. So at that point, I, I take out the drawing of the LM1, put it in front of him and say, look, this is the idea. The first ever flying balance wheel, first ever vertical power reserve, uh, the two totally independent time zones, but mostly it's, the, it's a flying balance wheel, of course, the most important part. And he's looking at this and he doesn't say anything for a little moment. And I said, look, if you have any pointers, where, where, what, what will you do? And he takes a, a pencil and he starts going, oh, maybe you should do this and like that. And the bridge would be looking like that and uh, et cetera, et cetera. And he goes on and he's like, he's mumbling to himself, oh, this, that, this. And we're looking at him all. Uh, he just puts his head up at some point, looks at us. And he's got these three people looking at him like that. And... Uh, and I ask him, does, does that mean you're actually going to do it? And this enormous smile cracks up on his face. And he goes, this? Oh, yeah, this I'm going to do. So there you go. I've, I've got goosebumps. I always have goosebumps with these stories. Um, those, are, those are the stories which make the MBNF story, which make my story de facto. It's about, as you were saying, it's about meeting incredible human beings. And so Jean-Francois... And uh, so Jean-Francois did all the engineering of LM1 uh, with us, of course, but I mean, he really did it. It was in those days, we didn't have any uh, R&D engineers internally. Now we've got five of them internally, but those days it was all subcontracted and working with Kari on the beauty. Kari brought the aesthetic balance. He brought the beauty. Um, he brought, of course, the finishing well, It was the first time he was going to have his name on a movement. And I told him like, we will do what, Ever you deem is necessary so that your name is on it. And so he said, look, okay, well, this is what I would like. The rose gold chatonnet like this, the, the internal angles, all hand angled, the hand engraving. You're like, really? Hand engraving? <laughs> like, yes, hand engraving. Okay, okay, we'll do hand engraving. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and so LM1 just slowly came to life. It, it was a, oh, it was a good three, three and a half year process. And I don't know if I told you the story, which is another very important story for me, is the first, first moment Curry actually saw the final watch. It was at Basel Fair 2011. We had this little booth, which was next to Urwerk and Christophe Claret and, and Peter Speakmarin. And uh, so I, I, I go and get him at the, uh, he was next to the academy. I go and get him. So, come, 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 come. Open the door, open the door, and I show him LM1. And Curry, over the years, has got to become more expressive. He was not very expressive in those days. <laughs> and I show him the piece. He puts it on his wrist. And he again cracks up like, Whoa. And in French, he says, oh, elle est magnifique. It's absolutely magnificent. And he's looking at it, and he's putting it on his wrist. And he looks up at me and says, would you, would you do a swap? Like, what, what do you mean? He said, you can take any piece from my collection if I can get this. Wow. Boom. You know, like, oh, I think I've done something right. <laughs> I, I think, I think we've, we've nailed it, that means. That's and, and that's how it started. And um, yeah, there, there's so many anecdotes around LM1 because and I, I, maybe, maybe I haven't spoke, I actually haven't really explained the story that LM1 was never supposed to be an LM. It was actually supposed to be an HM. Wow. It, it, I had this already, this sort of fetishism about balance wheels, and I wanted to show balance wheels. HM4, if you remember, we had managed to show the balance wheel. It was our first very totally integrated movement where you could see it. Well, HM1, yes, of course, we had the tourbillon on the center. And, um, and I was working with Eric Giroux on a watch which would have a big balance wheel visible. And my idea was cylinders. So I was drawing things with cylinders. So one cylinder would be the time and one cylinder would be the power reserve indicator and one cylinder would be the balance. Wheel. And whatever we drew was absolutely awful. <laughs> it was absolutely not something you would want to have on your wrist, at least. And, um, 
And more importantly, when we did manage to find something we actually liked, it was way too close to a piece unique that our friend Vianne Halter had done for Goldfile in 2001 that everybody's forgotten, which of course didn't have a balance wheel in it, but there were three cylinders uh, where you had, I think, the time, the power reserve and something else. I believe it's called the hidden Mickey. It, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and so whatever we drew, which would, would look like this, and I drove Eric completely crazy. I was like, no, we can't do something which looks like what Vianne has done. So we have to find another way. And we were sketching, sketching, sketching. This goes on for months. And at some point, I'm so frustrated. I mean, you know what? Forget all of this cylinder stuff. Let's do a classic round watch with a flying balance wheel. And we'll, like, like if it was a pocket watch dials on it. Eric got super mad at me. And Eric is, is arguably one of my best friends. He was the best man at my wedding. Um, he knows me like nobody knows me. And he got, re he got really upset, like, what are you doing? And he just stands up and, and leaves. And Serge, who was also at the, at the table, looks at me and goes, uh, very respectfully, we didn't join MBNF to create a round watch. <laughs> and so that's the beginning of LM. And uh, like, like many other projects, like Flying T and others, um, you realize that, it's when you really get out of your comfort zone, when you really take risks, you actually create something which is meaningful. You, you know, Max, I think what you said is, is extremely valuable. Um, you know, for me, 2011 and, and the first LM1, obviously, uh, was a seismic year for the watch industry. And I would say that's because um, Previous to that, everyone thought that in order to be super creative from the perspective of the design, that was equated with modernism, right? And, and I think that for, you know, people also you know, thought of you as being one of the pioneers in modern watchmaking, both um, in your own brand and, of course, at, the, at Harry Winston with the Opus Project as well, right? And I think when people saw HM4, they are like, okay, this is kind of like the ultimate expression of modernist, you know, kinetic sculpture is a term that we like to use all the time. And, and kind of like, where can he take it from here? And of course, we would get that answer several years later in terms of all the various watches that you've made, which continue to bring great creativity from a truly modern perspective. But in the context of 2011, no one had ever thought that going back in time, looking into classic watchmaking, you know, 18th century watchmaking, 19th century watchmaking could be super creative and be done in a way that for lack of a better term is incredibly sexy. And I think the first person who, like I saw, that was just raving about your watches was um, Patrick Kramer. Right. And, and I, and I and he was almost like kind of just talking to himself and I'm like, Patrick, what's up? You know? And he's like, have you seen Max's watch? It's incredible because he being a man who's incredibly intelligent and incredibly sensitive to, to watch details is like, he's done something revolutionary. He's made classic watchmaking and really classic watchmaking, super sexy and super relevant. And I think that that was um, the significance of what you created with the LMs. I didn't realize what I was doing. I'll be very honest. A lot of people, it's a bit like when I created Opus and I've told you the story when François Paul and I are walking down the, uh, the uh, escalator and I say, oh, we should do something like this. <laughs> and you see what it actually, how it, it translated into something which probably did change the industry. Um, I think LM, I had no idea where this was. Actually, I had, it was just one LM. I, it was my sketch of LM1. There was no LM2. There was no, if you told me that 10 years later, I would have come out with eight calibers, I would have looked at you and like, what are you even talking about? I'm just, at the beginning of MBNF, I am trying stuff out. I am trying to find who I am. I'm trying to, to, I'm trying to express myself. I have no idea who I am. So it would be very difficult to express yourself when you don't know who you are. And, um, and I didn't realize what I was doing. I um, also didn't realize the risk I was taking. Because between HM1 and HM4, we'd managed to build a little cult following of people as nuts as ours who, who loved those crazy 3D kinetic sculptures. Uh, and they found a breath of fresh air and, and they, they loved it. So that was our gang, that was our crew. And suddenly I'm gonna come out with something which is absolutely not what, what they, they are expecting, which is one thing. But more importantly, I think the industry viewed us up the legacy machine as the toy makers, which if you really want to piss me off, 
say that my pieces are a toy for whoever. They're works of art. They've taken three to four years of engineering with the best, as you said it. I wouldn't dare say it. they are the best. Um, it's insanely complex. The finishes are amazing. And people would just stop and look at it as, oh, it looks like a toy. And when we come out with a round watch, everybody is a specialist. You've got suddenly a million, millions of specialists because everybody thinks they know watchmaking in round watches. And they come out with their loops and they're like, oh, you know, what is this? <laughs> and if, if the finish hadn't been with Kari at that level, and we were talking of artisan finish, which already in the end of the, 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 the noughties, as we call them, um, they, they, most big brands had gone industrial. Yeah. So uh, it, was, it was something which was already very rare in those days. And, um, and everybody would have said, if it was not top, top notch, oh, you see, he's just a toy maker. And luckily, luckily, between the engineering, the idea and the finishing, it was totally top notch. And then all the specialists, you talked about Patrick, uh, whipped out the hell and like, oh, this guy may be serious after all. And it could have made, it made us, it could have broken us. Right. right. So uh, it's, it's really, um, with, with 10 years hindsight, you're thinking, wow, what did you do? <laughs> but that's the most of the story of my life. But, you know, that's the interesting thing, too, is, is looking back retrospectively over the last 10 years, it almost looks like you've mapped this out, right? And you're like, okay, I know each successive step I'm going to do, and five years into it, I'm going to create the watch that's going to become the most, one of the most iconic perpetual calendars in the world. But my question is, at what point did you realize, okay, I think I've got a massive hit here, first of all. Second of all, this is really interesting because I have now expressed two almost completely dimensions, two different dimensions of, of, of my creativity. Um, one vintage theme and one contemporary theme, and, and they're both equally powerful. At what point do you think, okay, we have to continue with this? And, and at what point did you start working on LM2 and LM101? So it's the beginning of my creative schizophrenia because HMs are clearly with my guts, my, my, I often say they're my psychotherapy. I'm, um, I'm, I'm revisiting my life and there is absolutely nothing rational in them. Legacies are a very intellectual pro product, project. It's my um, tribute to the great master watchmakers. I'm going revisiting and there are all the codes that I have to integrate, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a completely, completely different mindset. Um, I... The other thing which is interesting is that very quickly, the whole watch industry thinks legacy machines are what makes MBNF live because they cannot imagine that anybody would be nuts enough to buy our horological machines. But up to about two years ago, horological machines were probably 60 to 70% of our revenue. That's where, that's where we, were, we were making an impact. And many legacy machines just people love them, but you've got so much choice in the round watch um, category that it was probably not as successful as most people think, which makes them even more collectible because they're much fewer than what people think. And, uh, and we're going to release, uh, I hope at the end of the year, we're going to release all the numbers of every single product we've made. Wow. And, uh, and then people will realize uh, it was... Uh, a few months ago, a customer bought a Legacy 2 in red gold, uh, which is not a limited piece, uh, bought it pre-owned, and sort of wrote to us and said, well, can you tell me how many were made? So we were looking at how many did we, add? that's how we got that epiphany. It's like we started, like, how many were made of that? I I'm, I'm may be wrong, but I think we made like 30 or 31. Wow. And the guy goes, wait a minute, it's not limited. You only made 30. I said, yeah, we only made 30. And it, it comes back to, um, I'll always remember having lunch with Philippe Dufour when I, well, just before I launched Legacy 2 to show him the piece because the duality was my inspiration. In 1996, uh, it took me, uh, actually, I saw a first duality in 99, and it took me 14 years to transform that shock of seeing those two balance wheels behind that little watch into the two flying balance wheels. So I, I sat down with him uh, in, uh, in uh, it was in uh, Le Sentier, in uh, 
uh, I think it was with Tel Aviv. And, um, and I said, look, why did you only do in those days eight dualities? And he looked at me and he said, well, first they're a nightmare to regulate the two to two balance wheels with, um, with a differential and a complete nightmare to regulate. And we know that. And, and second, he said, nobody wanted them. <laughs> I made eight because nobody wanted them. I stopped, uh, nobody wanted a ninth. And that's exactly <laughs> what happened with legacy two. Now people are rediscovering it going, whoa, incredible. But there were, there were very few made. So, um, so I had no idea what the hell I was doing. And coming back to your question, so I started working on LM2 while I was working on LM1, of course, um, because while we were, this whole project of LM1s came together, I remember at one of the meetings, because of the duality, I sat at the table and I told both of them, Jean-Francois and Kari, I said like, can we now do two flying balance wheels? <laughs> and they were like, and both said, yeah, let's try. Amazing. And both of them, none of them had done, created anything like that. And so that's how we started on LM2. And then, uh, I mean, there's so many stories. Um, uh, then the LM101, that's another interesting story. LM101 is the only time ever that I got influenced by my retail partners. And so we had LM1. And most of our retail partners are like, this is incredible, it's beautiful. But when all our collectors come in, they've seen the photos, they think it's incredible, they want to try it, but it's a 44 millimeter watch. And even though it's, it's very easy on a very small wrist, because I've got a very small wrist, they put it, they see it in the showcase and they go, oh my God, it's a Panerai. Oh my God, I don't want this thing. And, and then they put it on there, oh, no, it's much too big. I can never wear anything like that. So my retail is like, do it in 40, do it in 40, do it in 40. And you know one thing at MDNF, I do not listen ever to what clients want because that's how we function. But when you start hearing it all the time, you're like, you know what? Let's make a challenge. Let's try and make a, a, a um, create a movement using the same enormous 14 millimeter balance wheel, but let's see how small we can make it. So it's more like the technical um, challenge. And we managed to create the little LM101, 40 millimeters. And uh, also all the retailers like, oh, your LM1 is too expensive. You have to make it cheaper. And I'm like, oh, I can make this cheaper. So finally we decide we completely massacre our margins. I think it was LM101 is 27% less than the LM1. And it's not because you've got one less power um, time zone, but your movement costs a third less, of course. And, um, and so we, we launched this and it's an absolute flop. I mean, it's a disaster. 2014, we launched LM101. And barely does the sellout of 20 pieces a year. Wow. And the miracle is that I kept this piece in collection because it was the smallest margin, no revenue, nobody's buying them. But as we'd spent so much money creating a whole new movement for it, we had to try and amortize it. I said, probably the only reason I kept it. And so for years, it was the, the ugly duckling of our, of our lineup. And then end of 2019 for Dubai Watch Week, uh, I'm thinking, oh, we should, we should do something for Dubai Watch Week. I mean, we should do a, an edition for our friend, uh, actually not even for the, our friend Sadiqi. So it's just an edition so that we launch something. And we hadn't launched many, for many years something on the 101. So we created the Palladium piece with this beautiful grayish blue color I'd found at Positive Coating. And we just announced 18 pieces and everybody goes crazy. And the 18 pieces go boom. And then five, uh, and then because all sorts of people couldn't get it, they started buying every single other piece was in the market. And then we came out with the LM101 with our friend, Edward uh, Melon from H. Moser and the 60 pieces sell in four days. And all the people who couldn't get them are buying everything. <laughs> and the LM101 has become our absolute bestseller six years after it was launched and when nobody wanted it. So every single of our piece pieces has a story which is never what we planned. Uh, okay. So there you go. Well, okay, I, I will make a one a comment uh, first. So it was quite funny. Uh, I remember I walked into our good friend Michael Tay's office as I do from time to time and uh, just to have a chat and he's like, oh, um, I wanted to show you something and, and he's showing me uh, the duality, right? Philip DeFore's duality. I believe it's the prototype piece. Um, and, he, you know, being kind of the smart ass that I am, you know, I, I, I'm like, 
Well, you know, Michael, of course, uh, Dufour's Duality, if I'm not mistaken, was inspired by this, you know, pocket watch that was made as a school project of, uh, I believe it was Albert Gustave Piguet, who then went on to become the 30s. technical director of Lemania and then made the Lemania 2310, which is one of my favorite movements. And then Mike looks at me, and goes, oh, and he reaches into his drawer and pulls out that actual pocket watch. <laughs> so, and then he, I said, then we both looked at them. So he puts that there and then he puts the duality next to it. And, I, and we both say, we need to put the LM2 next to it as well. Because we both, all, all three of us felt, so here you have something from the 30s, you've got something from the 90s, and you've got something from uh, 2013. And each of them have expressed that whole concept of two balance wheels, two oscillators with their results average to differential so differently and so beautifully as well. And, and, I, and, and your watch absolutely fits within the, those, that, those three extraordinary timepieces. Uh, and I know what you're talking about from a technical perspective, because I remember when I, I used to talk to uh, Philippe, he used to say, yeah, but you know, you got to regulate uh, one balance wheel a bit slower and one balance wheel a bit uh, faster. And then, and then, and I know in your case, because they're both on the dial, you had to make sure they were separated enough so they didn't enter into resonance. So it, it, it's, it's you know not an easy watch to set up, I'll put it that way. But I love the fact that like, now people get it and it's become so uh, crazily collectible too. Um, and related to the LM101, I love that. And I have to say the Moser watch that you guys did together uh, is one of the most stunning watches I've ever seen. It's absolutely breathtaking. But okay, I wanted to switch gears now and talk about uh, perpetual calendars. <clears throat> and uh, I'm going to play a game with you. So I'm going to name my three uh, favorite per perpetual calendars of all time, right? Um, so, the, or to me, the three most beautiful perpetual calendars of all time, then I'd like you to name them as well, right? Your, your own choices. Yeah. So for me, I want to start with um, the Paddock 3448. I think that that is, you know, from a purity of design perspective, it's hard to get better than that. Um, modern in its own way, you know, sort of uh, one of the sort of the seminal watches of, that, of the 50s. Um, but at the same time, uh, you know, really, like when you close your eyes and imagine a classic perpetual calendar, kind of you have a tendency to imagine that. Then I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say the, the Royal Oak um, perpetual calendar, right? Uh, I, I love that also because for me it was the real first sports chic perpetual calendar. And there you have a watch that's like the Playboy's watch, and you somehow make it. But oh, I'm a cerebral Playboy because I have a perpetual calendar in my sports chic watch that I'm now going to wear in the hot tub, right? But also from a design perspective, it's stunning and also ultra thin. And then I have to say uh, the LM Perpetual. It is, it is from my perspective, um, as iconic as any of those, as the other two watches. And I, and I also know I'm not alone in this perspective because when I talk to my friends, like um, our dear friend uh, Shari or Ahmed Rahman in, in London, he's of the same opinion. When I talk to our dear friend Gabe uh, in New York, he's of the same opinion as well. So for, Max, for you, what are, your, what are the most iconic perpetual calendars or just one or two of them? I will first of all agree with you with the Royal Oak perpetual calendar. Uh, I always lusted over that piece, the, um, the, the, the steel piece, so the original 39 millimeter. And one day I managed to get my hands on one of the very, very rare tantalum platinum pieces they made with a non-tapestry dial. Yes. And interestingly, Shari's got the same and we had no idea. And, and there were like seven made. Amazing. And uh, I love that piece. It was very heavy. And then one day, uh, actually, I sold it because I was never wearing it because it was too heavy. And then now I look at the prices and I'm like, oh, my gosh, what have I done? But it was, a, it was a, ah, it's an absolutely stunning piece. Um, I, would, um, I, put, I would put Roger Dubry's double retrograde um, perpetual calendars, which it. he developed with Jean-Marc Viderecht. And yes. we forget that is that it and was a Harry Winston Viderecht. Uh, yes. Exactly. And that, that, that module, because those these were modules, um, was actually put in the first Harry Winston. But I thought that that double retrograde perpetual calendar was absolutely stunning. Uh, I will agree with you with a, with a vintage Patek, but I, I'm going to go for something different. Um, I bought many years ago what is seemingly the smallest perpetual calendar in the world made by AP. It's a 27 millimeter square watch wow. in platinum with like more or less Cron de Vache lugs, not really like balls. And it was actually, it's a, it's reminiscent. It was made in the early nineties, which is actually a reminiscent of a piece that done, I think in the fifties or sixties. And uh, it's, I got the uh, Jägerlokult ultra thin hand winding movement base. 
the heart under a sapphire glass with the, um, the AP um, perpetual calendar. And let's not forget that AP was the pioneer of relaunching perpetual calendars. Absolutely. Remember the classic round for AP with the wide dials in 80, uh, 1990 when I did my internship there, when I was an engineering student, we all lost it over that piece. Yes. And, uh, and I think it's also, uh, it should come back because you can get them for nothing, those yes. pieces today. And, um, and they made also, actually, I'm digressing. It's so funny you like, mentioned that. Jean-Claude Beaver just posted that, well, that exact watch today, the 5548. Okay. <laughs> so, so there you go. I mean, AP uh, really can be credited for putting back the perpetual calendar on the map. And, uh, and so I've got this very small 27 millimeter. I mean, even my wife thinks it's way too small for her. But I just thought the technical boundaries they had to, 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 to get over to make this incredible watch is, is amazing. And they made only 17 of them. Uh, again, because nobody wanted them. And I think we really have to go hunting for all these quirky, amazing pieces, which nobody actually wanted. It's, it's easy to go and buy that sub and that that. Go get the piece that nobody wanted. That's the hunt. <laughs> I love that. Max, okay, so I have to ask you now, how is it that you came across a former theology student from Oxford University who, if I'm not mistaken, lives in Belfast and realized that this is, guy, is pretty much an undiscovered genius and then decide to make, you know, what we can objectively say is one of the most important watches in modern horology with him. Tell us about how you and Stephen McDonald met. That's, that's a long story I'm going to try and make short. 2005, I launched MBNF with my HM1, and uh, it was uh, being engineered and got all the parts were going to be made and assembled by a company called uh, STT in Tramelon. And, um, uh, and it was fantastic. And Peter Speak Marine helped me with it, and Laurent Bess, who had, all people I'd worked with at Harry Winston, and it was going fantastically. And then STT got sold to uh, a brand because they had financial issues. And, um, and so that was April, 2006. And, um, and then it became complicated because clearly that brand didn't buy the company to make movements for third parties, which I can understand, but I was basically a hostage of the situation. So um, it got pretty hairy. And on the 8th of January, 2007, uh, the new owners basically told me at a meeting that they, they couldn't actually assemble our movements. And we were already late. I had burned virtually all the cash I put in the company. And it's the only time in my life I think, I hope I will ever grovel. I groveled. I was like, please don't do this. Please don't do this. And uh, they were adamant. It was like, no, no, we just don't have the capacity. We can't assemble these movements. And that day, Peter Speak Marine was with me in the meeting for an incredible chance. I mean, karma is incredible. He was there. He was never there. He'd, he'd drove and driven up with me that day, and he saw me make a fool of myself and grovel. And at some point, he just takes my, my arm and he says, in English, let it go. We'll deal with it. I'm like, how are we going to deal with this? My company is just me all alone in my flat. I'm an engineer, but I'm not a watchmaker. I can't assemble those movements. And even if I could, I mean, it's going to take years. Um, it's 2007, pre-crisis. You couldn't get a watchmaker for the love of money. And I was like, and he said, look, let it go. So we drive down from Tramelon to uh, dr dropping off in Roll. And during that time, he's on the phone calling up all his chums, all independent watchmakers he, he was friends with. And he's telling them, look, my friend Max is in trouble. We have to help him. And everybody's like, dude, <laughs> we just don't have enough time. We're, we're assembling perpetual calendars, minute repeaters, tourbillons. We don't have the time. And he says, look, you owe me. Wow. You know that, that phrase is like that? Yeah. He is going to pull all his personal favors to help me. I owe so much to Peter in every single way, by the way. And 10 days later, we assemble in his workshop. There's Laurent Bess, who's there. I told me, like, I won't let you down. And four other watchmakers I've never met. And it's like Mission Impossible. We've got five trays of components where there are 50 which are missing, but we don't know which ones. Oh, and we don't have the assembly plans. And Peter basically briefs them with me behind. 
And he says, look, guys, we have to assemble these movements. And the guy's like, wait a minute. We don't know what's missing. We don't have the plans. It's like a gigantic jigsaw puzzle, but we don't know what the image is going to be. You're joking, right? And he says, no, we're not joking. This is the only way we can do this. And every two weeks, we would assemble. And people would go, what is this? Where does this go? How do you put that? And actually, everybody, everybody would help each other. And I was just, I was just, I wanted to kill myself. And, um, and Stephen McDonald very quickly took the lead. So he was one of them. And there were parts which were badly made, but the supplier didn't want to remake them. So Stephen would actually make them in his workshop at home during nights because he was a professor at Worcester by then. Wow. And so he was working in the evenings and nights for, for me. Wow. And so with him and the four others, we're gonna, it's going to take six months, six months to assemble the first movement. You, you should assemble them in two weeks, right? right. And, and we managed to deliver in June 2007 the first pieces just before I go into bankruptcy. So I sa they saved my company from bankruptcy. That's 2007. Wow. 2011, four years later, we're in Basel. Peter Speakmarin comes back to me and says, uh, do you know that Stephen is in trouble? I'm like, no. What happened? He said, well, he quit his job as a professor and he's actually developing a movement for a brand, but the brand is in severe financial situation and they can't pay him anymore. So he's all alone at home and he doesn't have a job and he doesn't have any money coming in. I said, okay, as soon as Basel is finished, I go up and see, and in those days he was in the Chateau. And uh, so I go up and see Stephen. I said, so how can I help you? I mean, of course you can assemble movements, but I mean, you're way too talented just to do that. And he looks at me and he says, well, we could do a perpetual calendar. And I was like, no effing way. This is not <laughs> going to happen. Not on my watch. They don't work. I mean, at Jaeger, it was a nightmare. They never worked. At Harry Winston, they never worked. Uh, I call them boomerangs. You, 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 you sell them, they come back into after-sales service. You can take them out of after-sales service, they come back into after-sales service. And uh, either they, 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 they stick, they, they stop, or uh, they, they jump when they shouldn't, or usually when all of that doesn't happen, the customer can actually break it. them himself yes. with, the, with the push up. Yes. And, and Stephen looks at me and he says, well, that's because the whole construction makes no sense. I'm like, well, <laughs> that's the way we've been doing it for 150 years. He says, yeah, so still doesn't make any sense. And let's not forget that Stephen never went to watchmaking school. So what he did, he always tried to understand by himself why something had been made. And he hit on, he stumbled onto the perpetual thing saying, this doesn't make any sense. First of all, most perpetuals are, are modules based on a, uh, on, a, on a movement. So the movement wants to go around in 31 days. And this module six times a year is going to tell that movement, no, nope, no, nope, dude, you're not going to do that. You're not going to go from 30 to 31. You have to jump from 30 to one. So it's basically going to force it to do something it doesn't want. He says, well, why don't we just start with a movement of 28 days? 12 months in the year, I've got 28 days. I'm like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, so, but then how do we do this? Because the whole grand lever system, that doesn't work anymore. He said, I don't know, but I've got an idea. I'm sort of, I've got something in my mind, but I haven't yet processed it. And as he had saved my company four years before, I said, look, okay, let, let's, let's give you a year. We'll fund it, we'll bankroll it. And if after a year, nothing makes sense, well, you're going to have to find something else. But if it does, well, we'll continue and go all the way. Make a long story short, three and a half years later, <laughs> Stephen McDonnell single-handedly, with the help of our team, but single-handedly created a 581 component movement that you're wearing on your wrist, which when we assemble the first prototype, actually worked. Now, how often does that work? I can tell you, it doesn't often happen. Uh, it, he reinvented everything. The famous mechanical processor he invented with the, with the whole system of on the 25th of the month, the mechanical processor basically tells the movement because it's been coded through the month that, oh, this month you're going to go from 28 to 1 or 29 or 30, etc. And that the idea that, okay, it doesn't fly forward because that's often how it, it blocks because you're pushing it forward when it doesn't want to, it flies back. Mm. 
And then the whole system of the clutches on the pushers so that you can't break your movement. You can never break your movement. And when he was telling me that, I was like, why didn't anybody think about it? Why didn't I think about that? That's genius. You know what genius is? It's a simple idea nobody ever thought about. Yes. And, uh, and so all of this in his movement, it worked. And, um, and we presented it in 2015 and uh, six years ago. And um, we were hoping, hoping to be able to sell 50 pieces. Uh, and we've crafted 30 to 35 movements a year uh, since that year. And there's never virtually been ever one in any retailer. Uh, wow. So um, it's a testament to, to Stephen's genius, to a great human story. Again, karma. It's all about that. That's why I try and... Because people, now that you get older, people start asking you for advice. <laughs> Before, nobody asked me for any advice. But now it's, I must be getting really old because people are like, oh, what would you suggest? And, um, and I tell them just like, life is karma. Treat people well. And you'll see something good will happen to you. And I think MBNF and my story is absolutely the epitome of that. That's really cool. And such an amazing story with your relationship with Stephen. I, I love it. it. It was almost like he took a chance and then you took a chance and this sort of predestination created, you know, what I consider to be an icon today. It's amazing. It makes me even more uh, fond of this watch because when I know that story about you and Stephen now uh, and about the faith you had in each other, it, it makes it kind of a, a wonderful expression of, of, of human kindness, you know, reciprocal kindness. Uh, and that makes me really happy. Um, it's funny because when I went to go pick up this watch, I was asking Harris, because, uh, you know, normally when you're adjusting a perpetual calendar, you, you know, you do a sharp inhalation and you do say a prayer, you sprinkle holy water on yourself, you know, okay. and then you, you kind of very precarious and he goes, and he actually said, do what you want. You can't break it. And, 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 and I love that. And it has the great, all the advantages of a synchronized perpetual calendar, but also it can be desynchronized as well, which is also remarkable, right? I mean, it's just so well thought out. Okay, one question before we get to the split escapement about the perpetual. I understand what Stephen did from a technical perspective, but you tell me, why is it so damn good looking? Uh, that is 100% Stephen. I am very humbled that so many people... <laughs> find that perpetual extraordinary and it's the only watch in our lineup of uh 19 now with lmx uh, pieces we've come out with in 16 years which i have nothing to do meaning yes i said i want the hour minute there i, I just put the dials i said this is how i want the uh, the flying balance wheel and the dials that's the only thing i sketched out and we had a big battle because initially i was like i don't want to see the movement and he said, what do you mean? I, he hadn't designed it yet. But initially, when we were starting, for me, perpetual calendars are very pure animals. Yeah, and they're already very difficult to read the time and the indications on. So I wanted it to be also perpetual where you could read the time. And Stephen, who clearly already had his idea, was like, no, 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 no. We have to be able to see the movement. I said, no, no, no. We want something very pure. I just want the base, the dials. That's it. He's like, no, no, no. So this went on for months until he showed me the first real drawings of where he was going to put the components. And I was like, okay, <laughs> okay, you, you go your way. You do whatever you want. Clearly you've got it nailed. Um, so yeah, it's um, a testimony. I mean, it, it is a legacy machine, but the whole movement, the layout and everything is 100% Stephen McDonald. Now um, we're working on a second caliber with Stephen and uh, I won't tell you when it's coming out, but it's going to be pretty mind blowing also because Stephen always find solutions to, um, to problems which are hundreds of years old. Wow. And, uh, and this is another new caliber, which will be coming out in some time where uh, he again blew my mind completely. Amazing. So one of the things that I love best about this movement, obviously, is how the, um, the lever and the escapement are kind of decoupled right? You've got the balance wheel on the top, but then you actually, when you turn the movement around and you look at the other side of it, that's where you see the escapement and the lever. So tell me at what point you thought, hey, wait a second, this unto itself could be an incredible watch and how it motivated the creation of the LM split escapement. That was the very first issue Stephen brought up when he started designing the, the movement. Like after three months, he came back to us and he said, you know what? 
I don't have the space for the escapement. Right. What? <laughs> He says, no, I can't put the escapement. There's so much going to be there. We can't put the escapement under the balance wheel. So I was like, okay, game over. There's, there's no more perpetual calendar. No. Maybe we could put the escapement at the back. Like, what are you even talking about? Since <laughs> I think Christian Hugens, I mean, we know one thing. We know stuff in watchmaking. We know so much stuff. It has to be. It's, it's, it's a pair. It goes together. You can't separate them. And he goes, why not? Again, he never went to watchmaking school. <laughs> it's like, let's try. So we, uh, he, he does some sketches for us and our team basically machine parts for him. And um, from by then he's, um, he's gone back to Belfast and, uh, and, he's, and, he, and he shows us, it works. Damn, it actually works. Uh, and so that's actually, I, you see, I even forgot to talk about in the perpetual calendar, but we kept on, when we presented the perpetual calendar, we, we forgot all the time to talk about this world premiere. And that's why at some point, when I decided we have to stop LM1, it was incredibly successful. Whatever we did, we did about 60 pieces a year, which was a lot for us uh, at any given time. We, we crafted in the last two years, we crafted about 200, 210 watches a year. So 60 was, was a lot. Um, we decided we have to stop. That's something I learned from Francois Paul Jean. I remember when Francois Paul, usually in those days already, would stop a, uh, a watch. I was like, why are you stopping it? He says, because you have to make it collectible. So 10, 10 years, 12 years ago, he told me that. I thought, if I want to make LM1 collectible, I have to actually stop it. And you need a lot of courage to do that. And so I wanted something which was more or less in the same idea, price point, whatever. And I was like, look, we've got this incredible invention on the perpetual calendar. Let's isolate it and make the legacy split escapement. And that's how to be the, the next LM1 in, in those days, it was the LS, LMSE. Incredible. I love the fact that you, you, know, you, you had this as a world premiere, but almost forgot to, to talk about it because uh, there was so much else going on for your perpetual. Mm -hmm.